be here. It's um, wonderful to see so many friends and um, people that I care about from so many different parts of my life and also people who care about writing and um, you know our world. So I'm going to forget to say this if I don't say it now. So I put together a whole collection of supplemental material to go with the book, uh, especially for when people buy it this month. And I was supposed to have an email list. Um, when you bought the book, you could sign up for it. And of course, I forgot. So you can. Um, if you're interested in getting that and you bought my book, just go on my website if you want and on the book page, sign up for the supplemental material and we'll just give it to you. Or you can just come up on this table and write your email address and I'll be sure that you get that supplemental material. Um, it's reading questions to go with the book, like kind of like reader's guide, uh, recording of my reading, 10 of the poems, uh, meditation and writing session with a prompt from one of the poems. Those of you who know my work, I often um, lead meditations and then give people time to write, so I do that with one of my poems. And then also a pack of 10 of my new poems. So I just wanted to give you a special thanks for buying the book and supporting me and rounding out the experience of the book. So I will put this, um, and if you didn't buy the book, but um, you want to be on my email list and you're not on my email list already, also, you can give me your email address and your name. As most of you know, I send out a lot of free resources for writers, um, meditations and writing prompts and lots of things. So I'll put this here. Um, And, okay, so I wrote out a little bit of things to say because this book represents uh, a lot of work. Um, I've probably been over every word in this poem, countless times, uh, in this book, in, in every poem in this book, countless times. Um, and it also has been a very long time in the making. Um, so first I just wanna, again, thank you all for being here. Give a special thanks to Eric uh, for supporting me in so many different ways. Um, a thanks to Simone. Wherever, oh, there you are. Um, for also supporting me and um, for being my muse in many ways. A thanks to Gabriel, who isn't here, for also supporting me and being my muse. Um, I want to give a special call out to Carrie um, for your support as well, and thanks for believing in this book. Um, and to so many of my friends and also my students, um, teaching poetry and teaching writing really helps me keep that passion for writing alive, and I'm so inspired by the work that my students do. So thank you. And thank you all for being here, um, my friends, in so many ways. So um, I wrote the majority of this book more than 14 years ago. Um, I thought I would publish it pretty quickly. The poems were getting published pretty regularly. I had sent it out to book contests, which is pretty regular, like normal way to get your first book, poetry book published, and it was a finalist, which is again and again and again and again and <laughs> etc. Um, but it was just there were a lot of near misses and it just never happened and eventually I just put the book kind of off the high shelf into the drawer and I went on to other things. Um, I wrote a lot of prose, I wrote other poems and then um, I took it out and I sent it off to a um, publisher and they accepted it. So here it is. Um, and it's very exciting to have it in my hands. Um, so I guess the moral of the story is be persistent. Um, <laughs> don't give up. Uh, maybe the time's caught up a little bit with the book. Uh, 
it's I'm not sure that the, some of the themes were as um, understood 12 or 14 years ago I think there are more people writing about motherhood now I think uh, more people are talking about trauma um, more people are talking about environmental destruction we, these are all themes of the book and um, so what can I say? I was just ahead of the time. So. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going to read the first poem from the book. Into Time. Any moment, the red door. Then the leaves, the many leaves, all yellow now. They are so thin. I think I can feel them ready to fall. One breeze, and you, there, walking or standing alone. What, what do we not become? So the book is very much about becoming, and um, I wrote these poems as a young mother, um, inspired largely by pregnancy and motherhood, and. Um, wanting to kind of asking the question of how do we make a home in this world uh, create safe places not only in our homes but in our bodies and ourselves for our children uh, despite the violence the destruction the uncertainty and how do we balance those more challenging aspects of the world with our wonder our appreciation and our joy and the experience of pregnancy and motherhood really broke me open and made me come to those hard questions in a deeper way and listen. Um, I was in a PhD program. I'd been kind of rewarded for being intellectual. And the answer to those questions wasn't really found in the intellectual world. And certainly, it wasn't my intellect that had made me, you know, pregnant or <laughs> <laughs> made me pregnant in the first place. Um, or, you know, grew those babies or took care of them. So I was really trying to like access other parts of myself and other ways of knowing and getting beneath the surface and listening to the silence. So these poems came to be very much about kind of stripping language away to see what I could get to underneath. And this um, poem is a nine part poem called Planitude Pregnancy, which I wrote when I was pregnant with Simone, uh, when we spent that summer in, in Greece. I was pretty, pretty pregnant. Um, and the landscape of Greece really inspired me because it was so beautiful and elemental and had been stripped down, largely actually because of um, the destruction done to the environment through you know civilization but there was this raw beauty there so plenitude pregnancy part two as the golden cup of emptiness inside little legs kicking up against my side your little lump now by my navel the stones of the hillside have been gathered into walls stripes along the hillside's middle towards which the sheep their legs hobbled close together, walk, eager for shade. The world into which you will come is a waiting bowl. Hear the high echo. Three, so everywhere anticipation. Now I make ready the tight constraint as subject from subject leading to verb. Four, the view of the land, the light that changes, the reversed hollow of the hill made of likenesses, even indifference. Far off, thistle like thirst, walk like a name called out in the dark, a single tree blown against a wall. Seven. Across the terraced hills, more terraces. The olives, the only green, and the spindly broom with its bright yellow blossoms. 
the land made to support them, the donkeys that evening carrying water, and below the aquamarine of the sea, now smooth as glass that brings back open-mouthed black plastic bags. Yeah. Oh, little one, all this that is not mine to give you, what will I give you? Eight. Their leaves a thick, dark, unguent green, their fruit too dry to eat. The fig trees brush all night, one against the other in the breeze. Sound like the sound of rain in our own country. When you are born, may I recognize the unseen in my arms. Nine. Came into the world. At center, a silence. Activity, a cry too high to hear, a rent in the sky, a single cloud, then will come. Continuity. The sky looks like something unspeakable, about to be said, then doesn't say it. In the world, look how many things are in it, and we like prairie dogs that make it through the burning. Last year, the trees on the hill in the forest were trees until they weren't. They gave, gave in for three months straight. 50,000 acres taken by this year's weeds from the fire of blackened earth. Elsewhere, always in the same place, geese, <coughs> white geese. One day I stopped and counted. 33, how life imitates the grace of thought. The next day they were still there in the water, though all along the path their white feathers were strewn, white, white as the sky is today. In my thoughts, the geese never leave the water. The prairie dogs come up in the first dawn among the weeds that grow from the burned down forest. The smallest girl runs singing through the gra grasses left unmown at the end of the season. In my thoughts, what isn't there counts. So, I wanted to think about our relationship to the natural world and to um, the things we make to keep ourselves safe. And sometimes in making things that we think are going to keep us safe, we end up inadvertently destroying things or our world. So <clears throat> as I was kind of working with this paradox, I worked with a series of poems about boxes because we kind of, again, create things with the intention of helping ourselves. And then sometimes those very creations turn out to be entrapments. And it was also kind of a traumatic trope, which I'm not sure I fully knew at the time, but now looking back, it seems like it can be read in lots of different ways, which is the cool thing about kind of stripping the language down a little bit from narrative is that there are many different narratives that we can give about these poems. So <laughs> you tell me what they're about. <laughs> the feeling of trying to express the feeling I can't even name. We assembled it. We made the corners tight. A box that might hold all of us safe from everything we wanted to escape and creating the idea of escape itself. <clears throat> what nature cannot make. So I was thinking about, so you understand the poem while I'm reading it, <laughs> the straight lines that we have all around us. I mean, everywhere we look, there are pretty straight lines and geometrical, geometrical shapes. But in the natural world, it's really rare that we see straight lines. Even if we look out at the horizon, the ocean, there's like a little curve. So I was thinking about our perception and what's natural and what's been 
shaped by our own creations. <clears throat> what nature cannot make? One, line, touching line, touching line, touching line. Four points at the four corners where nothing penetrates. Two, closed off as not even the deepest forest in the most lush days of summer, as not even the edge of the rock-lined lake. Closed off with intent, as not even the cat who cleans herself, who walks so assuredly along the edge of the balcony, who tilts back her ears at the call of the cardinal, leaps, as not even she, with her wise, her elegant ways, would of her own trace. Three nor would the sky trace, not even along the field's horizon. So everywhere in nature, the inescapable escape, the branches, thin, delicate fingers, reaching out to embrace the air that everywhere, everywhere, once touched is away. Four, but what, four, but with what only the human can make, I enter, then we enter, then shut the door to this well-ordered space into which I fold first one limb and then the other, then the four-chambered heart in the space that might be contained, held in place by wood that has been sanded and planed, nailed together with little nails that do not break. Namelessness. In the box, I put the body. There were no words for what had happened. Outside, all the other boxes. In some, no movement at all. In some, dancing. The color like a deep blue lake reflecting the color of sky. Who could say which was original, which the interior, which the exterior? Or like the color of the sky at dusk opposite the setting sun, all silver and the lake beneath all silver as if something were about to happen or had only just occurred. So, so I created all these boxes for myself and I was partly inspired by the work of Joseph Cornell, who's a visual artist who made these really amazing boxes, which he assembled from kind of found objects and <clears throat> I just found his work really inspiring. He also had a brother who had cerebral palsy living at home, and he was very close to his brother. And his brother um, obviously was wheelchair bound and had these real physical limitations. And, and I always think of Cornell's work as uh, kind of an expression of limitation and the longing for freedom. And, and I think I was kind of attracted to that, that kind of sense of limitation and longing that I think Cornell's work is coming out of. So this is a poem explicitly after Joseph Cornell. And uh, I'll read it. There was the opposite, it's called the physical world. There was the opposite house, not lit by the sun and the trees all dead like cut by the frame. And we were lying there trying to keep ourselves trying to keep the other, and the other trying to keep the other that was just the same with some little variation, and the brown shingle, and the brown shingle next to it, the world inlatched of itself made, and the boxes, the little boxes, each one just the same with some little modulation, and in the boxes, little partitions, and in the partitions, littler partitions, and there, in one, a bird. So um, when I was first thinking about the cover of the book, I was going to use a Joseph Cornell box, but then I decided to liberate the birds <laughs> and just have them flying in the sky instead. <clears throat> so I'll just read a few poems from the end of the book and then a few new poems. And then if you, anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer questions. Now, not the box, 
not the high shelf, but the breath, leaving, coming back. I lived in the suspension, caught by what I did not know. Now summer comes again, again the heat of the sun, again the children's voices rising from the sprinklers in the park. Everything I wanted to say is taken up in their voices and dissipates. A squirrel comes down the fence and rummages in the basil, eats one leaf, then another, and runs back up the tree where it has its own nest high in the branches, neither caught nor unsupported. And tomorrow? Tomorrow that the squirrel knows how to gather for, gathering not too much nor too little. Tomorrow that the squirrel does not even try to name. what can't be held. Gone endlessly, and I toward the future, like a sailboat to wind, like wind to the far no shore, where everything turns, like and like and like, to the unlike, as before me, what sings. So, um, I, I guess I'll add that I also, when the book came out, I, I ch or when the book was accepted, I didn't want to change it too much because I wanted it to, well, it was what it was, um, and it had its own coherence. I think I was writing the book in part out of a kind of namelessness. Some of the things in my own story I didn't fully know at the time when I was writing, and I wanted to keep that sense of suspension and that sense of not knowing because so often we don't have all the pieces of the picture. And when those pieces come in, the language changes. And I think we're all living with this sense of uncertainty um, on many different levels all the time. So I wanted to keep that, but I also wrote an afterword. So um, I'm not gonna read from the afterword, but I just, want to draw your attention to kind of like me now adding another note to the book in the afterword and thinking about, about that. So um, I have also three new poems that I want to share with you because they're really quite different. Um, this is a poem I wrote, I think, this week by Derek. <laughs> yeah, three days ago. <laughs> Another poem about birds. <laughs> Why not call them starlings, chickadees, mergansets, yellow-tailed hawks, warblers, great blue herons, striped kingfishers, barn owls? But I don't. I call them birds who soar together into the spaciousness, in my imagination free from names, free from classification. The heavens that we will never enter receive them. They do not speak, they sing. Oh yes, we project our imagination outward, but doesn't the imagination come back, teach us to, to let go of what defines us, to lift a little higher in ourselves, to fling ourselves into the wind, trusting that it will take us that we will not fall, that our own wings might, with a bit more exercise, propel us gladly towards the wider view. Mm. Simone and Ola, this poem's for you. <laughs> what my heart desires. I, I hope I'm not giving away a secret. <laughs> <laughs> at night, when it is hot, in the dark, at my daughter's camp, the girls take off their clothes by the docks at the wide mouth of the lake for special swimming. <laughs> I want to take off my clothes on the page the way I came here for special writing. <laughs> I want to feel utterly safe in a dark that is soft in the water that will hold me. Or is that what I want? 
I think the question over and over when I cannot sleep, when my mind will not turn off. What will the next years of my life, if I am lucky, hold? The waters of the ocean creep up the shore. The temperature slides up a half degree, then more. The high glacial shelf in the Arctic breaks off. I would be lying if I said this is what I see when I cannot sleep in bed. Instead, I see the clear water, the wide mouth of the lake waiting to hold me the way I know I am safe, held in community. My body, still a girl's, with the whole world before me, and utterly free, and my mouth open, in song, the words already written on the page. Mm. So, mm. thank you for being my community. Wow. are so quiet. Didn't you know there was a great symphony in your heart? Didn't you know that you were composing? The trumpets are so glad and the French horn in its great deep beckoning resounds. You who are so quiet, didn't you hear the calling from your stillness? As if you had looked out over still water to see the geese rise up in unison in front of the setting sun, such a squall of color, and your whole being given over to the one name, to the one who rests in the great up flapping, the geese mounting higher and higher into the growing into the evening, growing brighter and louder still. Mm -hmm.